I'm Mandy McLeod. Welcome to Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Burrow. Coming up in the show, how Japan may be the answer to some Australian farmers' prayers for survival. With an announcement looming in New Zealand on the Fonterra milk price debate, dairy farmers in Seoul protest against the price of milk. And with our high Kiwi dollar and increased competition from South America, what does the future for New Zealand beef look like? Joining me today on the show is Neil McLean, dairy farmer and Fonterra's shareholder council member, and Roger Wilson, senior partner at PricewaterhouseCoopers in Hamilton. Japanese grain and noodle processor Hakubuku Agri Limited have recently purchased 1,000 hectares on the Liverpool Plains in Queensland, Australia. In a move for Japan to buy directly from farmers in Australia and take that product to Japan amid concerns around China pricing and food quality. Now this is, I guess, throwing a lifeline to, to the farmers on the Liverpool Plains who are being challenged by the coal seam gas mining from the likes of Chinese investors and the Dutch, oil pro, uh, Dutch Shell. Neil, is the linkage between China and food safety becoming more of a real issue? No, uh, food safety is food safety. It does, we're dairy farmers, we're in the game of uh, selling high quality food. Uh, the Fonterra brand is quality. Uh, we have a supply line that's intact. I mean, it's where it goes in China or wherever it goes around the world, our quality is going to be intact. Yeah, but the question really is, though, is is it about an increased linkage with, let's say, brand China and food safety? Are we starting to see more people concerned about food coming from China? Roger. Yeah, definitely, and that's what this, this investment has been driven by for the Japanese. Basically they're concerned about the quality and the security of food supply from China. So by um, buying and creating a footprint in Queensland, in Australia, they're able to export directly to Japan, to the end consumer, take out all the middlemen, and ultimately uh, for what, I, what I've researched around this is that they intend to try and encourage other farmers yes. to supply them as well. It's about taking out um, cost on, in supply chain as well. So sure, food security is a big issue, it's quality, and the melamine example is a classic of that, and that's still ongoing in, in uh, China with food safety. Um, but the Japanese are now realising that we, we can get reliable quality food, um, and we need to invest in some land somewhere else to be able to do that. So I think that linkage is going to become stronger and stronger um, from, from these developing nations. The scientist in charge of this, uh, of, of, for Hakubuku, has also said that, um, and, I, and I paraphrase here, that um, mining has got no place in areas of agricultural significance. Is it a free market? I mean, <laughs> la land will be used for its best, best, applied to its best use. Yeah. If that is mining, well, unfortunately, it might be mining. Preferably, it's going to be agriculture because yeah. uh, it's far less environmentally damaging. But um, it will ultimately be applied to its best use, and it's a free market. So at the moment, it seems like Australia is the main beneficiary of this Japanese uh, policy. Do you think that New Zealand is going to be the next cab off the rank for this? Are we going to start to see more Japanese investment, you know, potentially bidding for Crafer Farms or getting involved in New Zealand? This is a specialised investment in, in, in grains, basically, which is to supply the noodle market, whereas um, it's only one component of the food plate. So whether Japan will invest in other countries, by all means, sure they will do, because companies, Japanese companies, will want to uh, secure their profits. It's a, it's a commercial business decision. Mm -hmm. it, it's a feature of globalisation. I mean, just to pick up on Roger's point, we've had um, Sunrise in Australia, mm -hmm. uh, Riverina. They had a takeover offer from Spain for the biggest uh, rice company in the world, to take over Sunrise, which is a co-op. Uh, directors recommended it. Uh, the co-op members said, mm, nah. The Spanish rice company was looking for supply lines. It was looking for market share. It was looking for uh, being able to supply a product at all times with known quality. Right? Fonterra is doing exactly the same mm. thing on the world market. And very successfully. Yeah. Well, Japan's already an, a large investor in, in beef finishing and processing yeah. capacity yes. in New Zealand. So already. Yeah, already. So it's yeah. a different p component on the food plate. That's, uh, that's yep. what it is in my view. Yeah. It's a supply line issue. 
so talking about that, we've seen, um, and, and there's a photo of dairy farmers in Seoul wearing morning clothes and tipping milk um, onto a, a burning pyre as they protest against the price of milk that are paid to them as dairy farmers in Korea. I didn't see John Campbell there. <laughs> no John Campbell? No John Campbell. The guts behind this is that um, the dairy farmers in Korea are denouncing South Korea's free trade agreement talks with um, America and the EU. Yep. Now what does this action say to you as a dairy farmer and as a Fonterra representative? Are the countries close enough for this to actually have an impact here in New Zealand? I think that's a reflection of a changing market. Uh, that the protection that has always been in place behind, uh, behind borders is gradually getting uh, tampered with, broken down with uh, free trade agreements. Uh, we're going to have the same protesting in the streets when uh, our uh, trade deal with America gets to the hard bits and uh, Pharmac gets put on the block. Uh, where do we draw the line there? You know, how much is for local benefit, how much is for the internet, uh, global market. This Korean protest is around the milk price, that they're not making enough money, so therefore the consumer is not paying enough for milk. There's a few government controls around price. Yeah. Now the, the Koreans are going to withhold milk, milk supply. Um, their problem is that the grain costs, their feed costs have increased. So if the New Zealand farmer loses his competitive edge and efficiency and production costs, yeah. um, no, that's not to say that 20 years time the same things might be happening in New Zealand, but we have to focus on our competitive edge, make sure we don't lose that. Mm -hmm. um, and, we've, and we've got a lot, of e a lot of advantages like that, we just need to keep on um, innovating and staying ahead of the game like that. Neil, speaking of our competitive advantage, sorry to, to cut you off there, I need to want to move on to beef. We've just seen um, the last week or so beef prices take a dip. Is this a knee-jerk reaction, do you think, to the future of a depressed beef market? Who knows? <laughs> the beef industry is a, is a mystery. Uh, you don't have a wee crystal ball or anything like that then, Roger? I, so I've got to say, I have too much spare time. So I've uh, adapted some work done by Vince Pooch out of Christchurch, who looked at the dairy industry and tried to peg payout to uh, take inflation out of it, peg it to US dollars. I applied the same criteria to... Uh, beef, and surprise, surprise, for the last 40 years it's been equivalent to $3 a kg meat. So there's been no improvement in those bulls leaving our shores through, it's all been currency or inflation. That doesn't tell me that we've got a great place in the future. The, the issue from my perspective with beef is that the New Zealand beef industry isn't large enough on a global mm. scale to be an influencer unlike dairy, wool and lamb. So re beef, that's the challenge for beef, is it has to differentiate its product from, from South America, from North America. And, uh, it's got to be organised. It, yeah, it, it's, a, well, it's a free market once again, um, but it's got, it's, it can't, New Zealand is never going to produce enough beef to influence the prices um, or the markets globally. And so we've got, we have to accept that. So, we have to so, to, so with uh, that glue, cut it? very, very quickly, so our competition point is not at the farm gate, our competition point is at the wall. Thanks team. Coming up after the break, a recent review of the Red Meat Sector Strategy Report has identified a few holes. We ask what these are and how to plug them. Water is the backbone of New Zealand according to the new Federated Farmers President Bruce Wills. Are we doing enough to simultaneously exploit and protect this resource? Is the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry playing Russian roulette with the Government Industry Agreement on Biosecurity Reform Bill? Mike Pedersen, Chair of Beef and Lamb New Zealand, thinks so. All this when we return. Welcome back to Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Furrow. Neil, I understand there's been um, a couple of issues raised with the Red Meat Sector Strategy Report. Do you want to tell us what these are? Well, one, the first issue is that I haven't read it because I haven't been inspired to read it. That's a real worry. Uh, second thing is uh, I struggle to see who's going to actually own the strategy. And once you have ownership, you'll have delivery. 
uh, I'm reminded of uh, uh, what we've seen in the States over the last two weeks. We've got had the Republicans and the Democrats in the same room talking past each other and and no one actually delivering what <coughs> should be the outcome that's going to suit the, uh, the people of America. I suspect the same thing is going to happen with the red meat strategy. Roger, we've just seen the, the formation of a group to oversee um, the implementation of this report. Do you believe that within that group there's enough leadership to pull together the potentially disparate groups that have to be pulled together to make this work? If, if this group can, I mean, the financial results will, will pull people together. And at the moment, uh, the industry is, going, is leeching around a little bit. Uh, it's, they, they've had a very good 12 months and the prospects are, are still quite good. The, there are three key, key pillars, in my view, to the strategy around competition, supply chain management and on-farm performance. Um, they, they've all got to come together and, and on-farm on -farm performance is one of the key issues, I think. I mean, if, if farm production can increase um, to similar sort of rates that the chicken industry, for example, you see graphs of where the chickens have grown across the last 20 years, um, the, 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 we need to get that on-farm performance improved across the full broad spectrum. And that in itself will be a significant gain for New Zealand and make the strategy a lot easier to, to deliver. You've got a lot of polarised positions, but um, if, if the industry can show the money, it's the Jerry Maguire principle, show me the money, I'm sure uh, all sorts of things can happen. But Roger, who is the leader? Who's, who's the, the honest broker? Who's going to be <laughs> the guy or girl? who's sitting there saying, we need to make this happen, people. Now, there is, there's not the people there at the moment who appear to be willing to take that statesman-like role. Uh, maybe Chris Kelly of Landcorp has, has a... But, you know, we're... That's, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a statesman who's going to lead us out. Yeah, that's, that, that will evolve. And, and look, you know, maybe, maybe a farmer like Landcorp, the large corporate mm -hmm. farmers might have have some influence, but you've got a number of private investors in the processing cap capabilities. They they want to make a dollar, yep. okay, and that's, there's no getting away from that. But there's there's three there's three links in this chain. If the processors don't make money, they won't innovate. If they aren't innovating and creating profits, the farmer won't be profitable, and he won't spend the money on the supply yep. and the services. Roger, just very quickly to pick up on that point yep. about the farmers making money. Do you think the fact that we we've seen a very strong uh, financial performance on um, a lot of sheep and cattle properties that have very little relevance to manage, managerial operation, that that is going to uh, be a potential red herring in this whole issue? Because we've seen a lift in, in on-farm profits that haven't had anything to do with productivity. No, that's, no, no I don't think so, no. I mean, there's the, the farmers, the good farmers um, are going to continue to be extremely profitable now and they'll be looking to grow their businesses. The farmers who are who, are, who aren't as good, who are sure they might have had a 12 month respite, they might have a 24 month respite, but ultimately um, there will be something, a day of reckoning will come. It's just a it's market efficiency. So, um, no, I, I think, yeah, it might be a 12 month respite, depending on lambing, beef prices, wool prices, um, and, and lamb prices this, the next 12 months. It might be 24 months, and hey, the longer it is, the better, but um, there will be a day of reckoning at some point in time. Speaking of a day of reckoning, We've got oodles of water, and despite we've got had some debates over how clean it is, do you think, Neil, that we're doing enough to utilise the water that we've currently got to produce more food? As a participant in the Variation 6 discussions with Environment Waikato at the moment, obviously not. <laughs> uh, it's a discussion that we need to be having. Uh, there is a case for irrigation in the Waikato, uh, that has to be balanced up against mighty river powers, uh, demand for total control of the river, plus the iwi having control issues. Yeah, water is, is our comp uh, competitive advantage. We have to have a strategy that delivers a sustainable uh, program for the next generation. I mean, the dairy growth is going to be in the Canterbury, Southland. We have to have a plan.
The, the water, the water story is quite, quite incredible when you drill into it. I mean, there's a no pun intended. No, <laughs> true. <laughs> Look, there's well, it doesn't have to be drilled into either. But there's 1.9 million hectares in New Zealand land that could be irrigated. There's something like 600,000 hectares irrigated currently. 350,000 are in Canterbury. Now, in irrigation schemes that are on the drawing board right now, there's another 350,000 hectares of land well, that will be irrigated in the next 15 years. Now, that's primarily Canterbury and Hawke's Bay and Wairapa. So we, we are becoming aware of it. Uh, the government has indicated they're prepared to commit some money to it um, across the long term. So uh, are we doing the best? We're working on it. Uh, our water supply is our, it's our, it's our gold. Uh, because it's renewable, it's renews, it, it replaces itself every year. So uh, it is, it's going to be the key to us, uh, the country being extremely Just wealthy. very but quickly. We, but we have to bring the community with us. Yep. But do you think there's a danger of water being sold offshore, like, I guess, in, in terms of rights, like coal has been in Australia? We're going to talk about virtual water. Well, let's not talk about virtual water. Your, your, um, your, your pause and hesitation on this is enough. OK, so the Biosecurity Law Reform Bill. This has been debated over for the last five years, and despite that, no industry that I've been able to get hold of knows much detail about what is in this reform bill. To me, it seems to have more holes in it than Swiss cheese. So, Neil, why do you think there are so many information black holes in this? Perhaps it's government... Uh pushing more indirect taxes back away from central government and talking about reduce, you know, I, I could get paranoid about that. <laughs> <laughs> but we did not have don't, that. Don't do that. <laughs> oh, the, the, it's a glo we talked about a global market before and, and the, the, the world is changing. We have a lot of free trade agreements coming along. They're all going to have implications around borders and free access. And if, if we want free access to the States for our dairy yep. products, they want free access to New Zealand for pork, Apple for example. Apples. Apples into Australia now, isn't that? that it's one, a you know. We could talk about that for a hundred years, but <laughs> it has <laughs> but, been. Yeah, exactly. So, but but the principles. What what's good for Australia is good for us. But what I don't get though is that it's not about changing biosecurity per se. It's actually who's going to pay if there is a breach. That seems to be what it's coming down to. If there is a breach and it is going to impact on, say, the kiwi fruit industry, as we've seen, the pork industry, then they pay to fix it up. Yet on the flip side, if you travel through Auckland now, or even some of the smaller uh, you know, airports like Waikato and Rotorua, you, you can almost feel a lack of emphasis on biosecurity that there used to be in the past. Do we, do we want the government to pay for everything? The governments are running deficits. Yep. Does the producer pay? Um, sure, it's better to be at the border and stopping, uh, stopping those, those diseases entering the country because we do have a haven. But, but it's aren't a, they going further back into the su supply chain to look to make sure that it is intact right from the source rather than at the border? That's what they need to do. Mm. I mean, to me, you know, their argument for if you want dogs in Hamilton, bring your own. Now, I don't know about your dogs, but I really can't see mine being much chop at border security. And, and I guess, why do we have uh, a biosecurity team? I still think that, that it is a national issue if we're saying that the growth of New Zealand is going to be on the back of agriculture. Surely it's a New Zealand Inc. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. So, direct access. Direct access. <laughs> direct access. Direct okay. Access? <laughs> <laughs> consensus. That's a first on straight no, to no, it. No, no. Okay. Not not consensus. Consensus. <laughs> okay. The After the break, <laughs> we ask Neil and Roger what hot topic in the rural community has got them cheering or jeering? Will it be a rant or will it be a rave? You can join us after the break. Welcome back to Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Furrow. It's time now for our weekly rant. <laughs> and Ray. Roger. My, we've actually touched on it earlier. My rave is about New Zealand's water position, the fact that we're starting to realise its significant potential and there's some serious work going into some irrigation schemes. The government have come out with, uh, with two tranches of funding to uh, one, develop regional schemes and then spe uh, support specific schemes once they, uh, once they prove to be commercially viable. So I think as, a, as an agricultural country, the potential through water is going to be, um, our, our, really it's going to be our great big gold mine. 
and we just need to continue to invest in that. It won't all go into dairying. If some will go into market gardens and other food sources, yeah. best use of land. Uh, but we've got phenomenal amounts of water. Uh, we need to preserve it, look after it, and, um, and make sure that all the stakeholders take a, a really rational approach towards it. Grow the regions. Look, grow the regions, yep. Yeah. Uh, that'll create jobs. It's just going to be great for New Zealand, yeah. yeah. All right, Neil, what have you got for us? Ah, it's a challenge. Um, <laughs> How I'm, unlike you. <laughs> I'm just taking over this whole thing. No, uh, my challenge is um, I am going to accept the Minister of Agriculture's uh, invitation to respond to his uh, uh, comments about DERA and the regulations, and I'm going to offer my considered opinions about where things should head in the future. My challenge is to the rest of the viewers and uh, farmers, dairy farmers across New Zealand, is to also um, take the time to look at it, uh, the MAF uh, response, and uh, get involved, let the Minister know what you think, because that is what's going to create the, uh, the government's position about DERA. Uh, broadly, I'm in favour of DERA because it allows uh, people to get a leg up, but we, the eligibility has to be sorted out. One or two other issues about uh, you know, you take your milk and you, you pay for it and things like that. But the broad concept of DERA is good. We just have to make it suitable for these times. One of the issues that I understand it with the Dairy um, Restructure Act is around the wording of the milk that Font, the six million dollar, six million litres that Fonterra has to give away, so to speak. Six hundred million. Six hundred million. Whew, near me in maths. <laughs> 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 no comment, and Roger. So, and so, and <laughs> so. Minor details. Minor details. Um, it is around that it was supposed to uh, promote internal competition for Fonterra with the liquid milk market, and well, that's uh, not. That was, that was one of them. It was one. Oh, yeah, it was one of them. Yeah. But that doesn't seem to be happening. Uh, uh, the international exporting of, uh, of milk th using Dera milk doesn't seem to fit the original intent of the regulations. Mm. Uh, and that's what I say about it should be a leg up, not a prop. Uh, you know, I'm going to pick on some of my neighbours at Tartar and Westland, but they've been established for 100 years. Mm. Why do they need dairy milk? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, Open Country Dairies has been on operation for five years-ish. Uh, Similarly the same? They've got their own supply. Why do they need continued support? If Maracas setting up, needs to get itself established, let it have some milk for two or three years, then it, it has to stand with its own performance. Mm. And they're small, they're dynamic, let them compete against Fonterra. It'll challenge Fonterra to deliver. Um, no, I have no problems with it, mm. providing we get the eligibility s sorted out. Which seems to be the real sticking point, doesn't it? Yep. Mm. Great. Well, my rant. Fonterra? Why have you waited until now, the beginning of August, to send out your diaries to your dairy suppliers who rely on the diary to fill in all of the information that you request? It has been driving my contract milker mad, who's been making my life hell. Please sort it out for next year. Roger, I want to come back to your point about water. Yep. I really want to know from you how much of a of a of a of the debate around water use is being delayed or distorted over the conversation that's happening around water quality? I don't have the direct answer to that question. Um, I think yeah, there's a whole number of stakeholders with an interest in water, whether it be game and fish and thing and and pastime activities as well. So it does have to be a collective view around it. The, my, my own view is a little bit that we have peak times, we have surplus water which floods and we wash out to sea as quickly as possible. So uh, whether, we, whether the, the technology is not there yet but whether we're able to divert that into holding ponds, lakes, whatever it may be and release at other times for irrigation because I'm, uh, that, that, that sort of technology I think is where we need to, to get to the investment to make it 
to make it viable um, right. and recognise those stakeholder interests because um, pa pastimes are important. That wraps up our latest edition of Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Burrow. I'd like to thank again my guests Neil McLean and Roger Wilson. And thanks to you too for watching. Remember to check out our website at country99tv.co.nz for all the latest in rural happenings. We'll catch you next week and in the meantime, keep on smiling. Music